the participants of this talk. Sasha Stiles is widely recognized as a pioneer of generative literature and language art. Her award-winning work fuses text and technology to probe what it means to be human in an increasingly post-human era. She has been named perhaps the leading blockchain poet by the magazine RightClickSafe. Aaron Penne, based in Seattle, is an artist and engineer. He makes generative art in the blockchain since 2018, being a pioneer of this development. He is also director of engineering at Artblocks, the most popular blockchain specialized in NFT art. In 2022, he was awarded the inaugural Lumen Prize of Art and Technology, the NFT award, with his collaborator Boretta for the audiovisual project Rituals Venice. Casey Rears, based in Los Angeles, is an artist and professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. He holds a master's degree from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Media Arts and Sciences. Casey is also a co-founder of the Open Source Software Processing and the Processing Foundation. Ria's artworks has been featured in numerous solo exhibitions at museums and galleries all over the world. The talk is moderated by Susanne Pech. Sasha and Aaron, many thanks that you have a bit of time for me tonight uh, and we will be able to to do some advanced communication uh, related to the summit where we will meet uh, soon in July in, in Berlin. I'm very glad that both of you will share the event. I'm really looking forward to it. We will begin with a question that is very general. Uh, I would like to know what is the essence of generative art for you too. Uh, we, Sasha, maybe you begin at first. Um, it it's, has a long history, but you are in the 21st century now. Uh, so what is generative art? What does it mean for you? Well, um, first of all, just to say hi and thank you so much for convening us all for this lovely chat and can't wait to, to see you all in person in July. Um, so generativity, I think for me, means something maybe a little bit different from the way we think about it in the art world, because as a poet and as a writer, um, I've often heard, you know, the term generative used in context of things like a generative poetry workshop, for example, or a generative writing workshop. Um, that's sort of a phrase that I think is very familiar to a lot of, to a lot of poets and writers. You get invited to come into a class uh, or a workshop environment and you receive a prompt. The teacher, whoever's leading the class gives you a prompt and then you kind of take that prompt and run with it. And so it's it's more of an analog notion of generativity. Um, so I think that's kind of what I came into this um, arena um, really sort of associating with the idea of generativity was just the, the more abstract relationship between a prompt and then you know how you interpret that and how you respond to it and how you output it, but not necessarily in a sense of computation. That being said, a lot of the work that I do and that I've done for a long time, even um, you know, even before starting to work quite so intensively with AI, has really been interested in exploring generativity also in terms of the traditions of automated writing and aleatory writing and computational poetry where you know where, where poets and writers use algorithm or use process to shape a text and so that's also kind of um, influenced my understanding of generativity is you know is there a process or are there a set of rules or a guideline or is there some sort of programming whether it's computational whether it's more of a metaphorical program or a metaphorical code that sort of, you know, helps you as a writer have some kind of poetic constraint and sort of, you know, acts as a bit of a vessel or a container for the way that you are manifesting language. And so I think, you know, for me, it's it's more about that kind of relational aspect, you know, whether the whether there's a prompt that is really about um, eliciting a response or the prompt is more kind of creating a framework or a form or a structure. Um, it kind of 
you know, runs the gamut, I think, and, and covers a lot of those different um, ideas in my own head. And of course, you know, being part of this amazing generative art scene has continued to help me evolve my understanding of what generativity is and can be. But um, really at root, I think I was coming in thinking of it as, um, you know, how do you use in its most basic terms? How do you use um, instructions? How do you use code? How do you take a prompt and interpret it and turn it into something um, that is uniquely yours? So Sasha, you are a very special uh, artist uh, in the generative art section because you are working with language. So that's definitely different when I'm looking to Aaron. You come from the traditional visual art, um, but I think you have also some, some additional ideas about generative art from, from your perspective. Certainly. Actually, Sasha, a couple of things you said there gave me some thoughts that I um, would love to get into with you around poetry, having so many rules uh, and certain types of writing, having predefined patterns and structure and these sorts of like templates, I guess, where you can work within that poetic constraint. I really like that idea. Um, I feel like that's a lot about how I think about gender of art is sort of defining those constraints, defining the system that your creativity can channel through. And so if you're forced into a certain type of pattern or a certain type of structure that enables a certain kind of creativity that you may not have had if you had a like a page. So I think having these kinds of rules or systems in place allows a different kind of expression. And that, I think when I say generative art, what I mean is um, creating something that makes something else. I like the idea of being a systems builder, um, creating some sort of algorithm or process or rule set that allows something else to come through. And as an artist, I feel like my hand is in every part of that, but of course I'm giving up a lot of freedom to the system and to the inputs. Um, when you mentioned the prompts that are provided in the workshops, I feel like that's like an input that you'd, you would take and then you get to translate and experience that uh, and put something out within some constraints of like a sonnet or a haiku or whatever it is. And I feel similarly when creating visual work, <clears throat> you take some inputs, whether it's randomness, whether it's a color palette, whether it's some data, and run it through the system that you define, and then you have something beautiful, hopefully, on the outside. So to me, I don't think of it so much as uh, generative art, more as like systems or procedural art. The term generative uh, now aligns so much with AI stuff. I like to keep it a little bit more clear around the, if you're the one building the system itself, then to me, for me personally, for my practice, I consider that uh, the generative art side of it. So but that's a hot topic. Let's talk maybe a bit about the code, uh, Aaron, um, because the code or let's say the algorithm, um, I think is, is very important and you both uh, focus to that. So can, can we explain a bit more or talk a bit more about the code and the importance of code? what does the code mean for you? Is it the core of the artwork or is it the image? Aaron, how, how would you see that? Um, that's a great question. I think for, for me, for my practice, it's both. Um, I like the idea that the code itself is a form of poetry. When I was first um, really diving deep into writing code 10, 12 years ago, 15 years ago now probably, um, my mentor, who was one of these uh, Linux kernel developer types, very deep in the lower level uh, implementation of code, he treated it like poetry, like a Zen meditation. When you're writing code, you have to understand very deeply the algorithm underneath, the assembly code that's being generated and, and all the machine operations that are happening as a result of the language instructions that you give. And so that shaped the way I think about writing code. I think of it as a form of... Um, it's beautiful in its own right. It's elegant in its own right. Um, and so I, I like to think about the artwork as not necessarily the resulting image or animation or live performance of some code, but as a combination of the two. So for me, it's both the artwork exists within the code and also uh, without in, in the image itself. So Sasha, uh, the code is is the the artwork you are working with. So the language. So that's a bit different when we are using a code to make images as a purpose. So uh, how, how did you get into the 
real computer code and how was this transition for you from the language code that is also a code of ideas of uh, of what 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 else is in our head and how did you migrate into the um, digital code yeah it's a really good question um i you know i've studied language and literature my entire life and i um you know i think unlike a lot of artists who are working in the generative or the ai space i don't have a formal background in computer science or um you know as i don't have a lot of experience as a developer or anything like that but um you know i started to get very very interested in natural language processing um and that was kind of my my invitation in was sort of this recognition that there was a lot of experimental writing that was starting to happen um empowered by generativity empowered by these kind of next next level um, automated systems. And as someone who's always really liked experimental poetry and conceptual poetry, I just got very um, intrigued by a lot of the you know, implications of that. And I think I just decided early on that I wanted to try and uh, you know research as much as I could, absorb as much as I could. Um, and, and I threw myself into it. And I think I've sort of, you know, learned a lot, maybe through, through that, through research, through osmosis, through studying, um, much in the way that, you know, in my career as a student of literature, um, I spend, you know, I've spent so much time pouring over texts and close reading and, you know, analyzing the structure of language and really kind of trying to understand how a writer has engineered a piece of literature. And so I think that's kind of something that I was able to transfer over to this, you know, at first more unfamiliar realm. And the more I, you know, poured through white papers and I read through, um, you know, various GitHub repositories and the more that I kind of looked at examples of code, um, both both code for fine tuning language models and also code for creating generative art, because I've used, you know, both of these different approaches, but the more I looked at it, the more familiar it started to seem to me, um, you know, coming from this background of, of researching and then bringing in material and assembling information and citing sources and kind of pulling from here and pulling from there and assembling things into, let's say, an academic paper. There's something about that process that felt, you know, like it was relevant to the to this experience of 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 you know assembling cobbling code together in the early days for me and you know similar to the process of writing a creative um, work in my approach as well I I do a lot of um, I write a lot of poetry that is you know bringing together ideas from a lot of disparate sources or that is maybe trying to collage. Um, maybe even different languages or, you know, ideas, quotations, citations from different texts. My work is very intertextual and really is about kind of pulling in a lot of different um, sources and inspirations and voices and ideas, and then really compressing it and kind of distilling it and calling it back to kind of the most simple, pure, impactful version of itself. And to me, there was something really deeply resonant between that process and this process of trying to assemble code. Um, and I really love, um, I love the process of, you know, again, I'm not a great coder by any means. So I start off with something that's very rough and ragged. And I love the process of going through and editing and simplifying and looking at the patterns that emerge. And that to me, like is a kind of visual poetry. It is a kind of, you know, a, a poetic format. Um, that is its own special thing. And then it also kind of gives rise to these secondary texts or these secondary layers, um, which I, I love. I love that process. And again, um, it, there's a deep relation, I think, between the way that code can be used to run a program and to make something happen and the way that a poem is a little machine for making meaning and generating emotion, generating feeling generating thoughts that are otherwise inexpressible. To me, it's it's this relation between the very sort of compressed, concise, you know, the, the most um, kind of purified text-based version of something, and then how that translates into something transcendent 
and complex and beautiful. And it can only be accessed through the code. And to me, again, that's poetry and that's technology. Um, they're, they're both in there in very deep ways. I really love the way you describe that as sort of like a distilled, uh, rarefied kernel of the idea or of the of the essence of what you're trying to do and having that be sort of the, the prism that the idea is able to expand out from. That's really beautiful. So so one, one question behind that. Um, your work is visual and it is language. Um, is there any priority or do you try to give no priority to the work uh, to balance it between vision and the poetry, poetry, the language, that that would be interesting for me to learn a bit about that. It's interesting because I think it um, it constantly is shifting and sort of changing, and I I tend to sort of take a single text and explore it through a lot of different facets or through a lot of different mediums because the experience is always so different. So I really I like both the very simple. Um, you know, thing that happens when you're just, you're a reader encountering plain text. Like, I think there is something very profound and very transcendent about that, which I want to be in conversation with some of the visual work where I'm also integrating color or motion or duration or, you know, all these other um, effects that I can, I can bring into the poem that I can introduce into my vernacular, um, thanks to all these, you know, technological tools those can do different things. And I, I like them all to sort of be in conversation with each other. And I like sort of exploring how a poem can exist in a lot of different ways and how it can, I don't know, take on different forms and how in each of these different manifestations, it does something a little different. It engages the reader in a different way, or it sort of becomes a different version of itself. And to me, again, there's something about that that is kind of relevant with the way that um, with the way that generative art, like long form generative work, for example, um, is created where you have, you know, this, this nugget of information that is always the same. And then depending on the context, it becomes something different. And I like the idea of a poem becoming something a little different, you know, depending on whether I, you know, plug it into a template with FX hash and play with it, or if I'm, you know, using motion graphics and turning it into a big projection or, you know, it can be all these different things. And I really enjoy, um, yeah, I enjoy kind of playing with all those possibilities. Erin, I, I want to know a bit more about the Generative Artist Club. You, you uh, invented, you, you set up. Um, and I, my first question is, uh, do you have any other uh, artist in that club doing, working with language, with uh, similar things that Sasha is doing, or is this very special? The Generative Arts Club is simply a way to have artists who do this kind of work communicate without pressures of... Uh, public conversation, right? And it started so many years ago, having individual conversations with um, 20 or 30 or 40 artists all happening in parallel and felt like it would be better for everybody if we were able to share ideas in a larger forum. So it started out as 40 or so artists, 2018, I think. And now it's about 500 artists and a, a lot of a lot of active conversation. Anytime um, there's drama on Twitter or a new um, feature being released for a platform or a new um, museum show, there's always some interesting behind the scenes conversation happening um, in this in this group. I would say that the group to me is is special, of course, um, but it's one of many. There's several groups um, around the country, around the world, and I think that there should be more. I think having artists communicate, having anyone communicate is, is beautiful, especially having the ability to communicate with people who are exploring the same kinds of paths that you are. Um, a lot of a lot of times it feels very lonely when it's you know two in the morning and you're struggling with some art uh some artwork that you're you're bashing your head against for the past couple of weeks and uh it just it feels like a particular very um, individualistic um expression but then when you zoom out and realize that there's a community of hundreds of people doing the same thing as you it's just it's really powerful and it helps in my opinion improve your own artwork by being able to relate to others that are doing similar things 
um, when it comes to language, yeah, there are artists, of course, doing um, work with language. Um, I can think of a project uh, that Melissa Widerek and um, Ana Maria Caballero did recently. Um, I think that there's several artists in this group that are playing with all kinds of mediums, right? Code and visual outputs is just one pretty thin, I would say, uh, maybe overrepresented avenue of what I would consider systems art or generative art, right? It's it's a particular tool to create um, procedures that create interesting outputs. And so it, it is a, the most prevalent tool, of course, uh, at the time, or currently, I'd say. But it is certainly not the only one. So a lot of people use these ideas and experiment with them um, in different mediums. And to me, that's, that's really exciting. I think relying on the methods um, for the past 70, 80 years is, is interesting. There's a, a lot to learn there. I myself spend a lot of time researching, studying, and recreating um, things in order to learn. But I think doing new and interesting things, taking these ideas that we use in this algorithmic world and apply it to medium um, media that are not as typical is much more interesting and more exciting. So anytime we see that, we like to encourage as much as possible, I think, yeah. And AI, well, AI is a is a language model, so there the connection is is very strong. It is mm. uh, both; it's a code and it's language. Does uh, does uh, AI and language models uh, revolutionize the art world? What is what is your impression? Let's start with Aaron first, because uh, moving from your uh, club, maybe, uh, and what you see there in the world being connected with many hundreds of artists. I think that that personal interaction, that personal touch, I would say, is uh, is incredibly important. And as it relates to AI, I think is a much bigger um, discussion, whether or not AI revolutionizes the art world as far as the small view of the art world that I have. I would say, yeah, it certainly has an impact. I personally like to not use it as much as probably could <laughs> just as a as a principle as a rule I think to keep I like to keep my hands uh in the dirt when um gardening right I like to keep my hands very close to the uh to the meat I think Frieder Naka mentioned this in one of the interviews that he had with you Suzanne and that to me that resonates very uh very loudly I think it's very for me personally very important to stay close to the craft of the work um and there's a lot of ways you can use AI to speed things up with code generation or bouncing ideas. I really like the idea of using it as an inspiration tool, right? You have some concept in your head and you're able to create a visual of that and then work from there in order to make something new. So there's a lot of ways that folks are using it as inspiration, which I really like. Um, Emily, she just did a fantastic project that she presented to the United Nations uh, very recently where she generated a lot of images and culled those images and created a, a beautiful collage using code as part of it. And she said it was a way to sort of, as an artist, reclaim um, what AI has, potentially will be taking from artists, right? So she's using it as a tool to further her um, creative expression. To me, those kinds of instances are, are a beautiful use of, of a new technology. One of the things that I really enjoy about um, generative art in the past, you know, since the 50s is that when when folks are using um, when folks are working in this medium, they're using whatever the latest technology is. And I think that's really interesting with, um, you know, plotters, with computers, with blockchain, with AI. There's a lot of possibility at the cutting edge of whatever the current technology is. And that's where things are exciting. Like I was saying, working with different media that is not necessarily um, typical. I think that's very interesting. Working with the new technology of the day is what, the tradition is that we've that we're part of, I think, and pursuing that, uh, pushing that edge as much as possible is interesting. So I'm excited to see what people do with with AI in the context of generative art, certainly. And Sasha, how about you? Uh, language models and AI that's that's your focus in any case. How how did you merge? How how was it going from the world before into the world with a language model and? Uh, AI. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I also have to just echo Aaron and say Emily's presentation, I thought was wonderful. I'm a huge fan of her work mm -hmm. and the way she speaks about her process 
is really illuminating. Um, so that was that was wonderful to see. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, I tend to I tend to be very interested in using AI both. I think from maybe like the more of like an aerial philosophical view, as well as in terms of, you know, a lot of the technical hands on, you know, what can it do for me as a tool piece of things. And I, you know, I've gotten increasingly sort of interested in, um, in putting AI and generative language at large, but, you know, specifically AI generated language, kind of within the bigger trajectory of the history of language and all the linguistic innovations that have brought us to this point. So when I think about writing with AI and all the things that it portends and all the ways that it changes the status quo in terms of how we think about narrative and how we think about authorship and you know even distribution publication things like that i kind of it helps me i think just to grapple with it to put it into the context of okay you know there've been these seismic shifts before like the introduction of the printing press which completely changed you know not just the technology of how things are made but also kind of changed the way we think about ourselves as storytellers gave rise to new kinds of literature, changed uh, the way information is shared and that flows around the world, that changes the way, you know, we kind of, um, we we narrate our lives for ourselves. So, you know, I think about it kind of in terms of, um, of that kind of a development or, you know, going back even further, what was it like to be, you know, to be living through a moment like you know, the transition from an oral tradition, from a society that really um, understood language as an oral and auditory form of expression to go from that to start to have language, you know, made concrete in tablets or inscribed on parchments. And what did that mean? How did that change consciousness? How did that change the way we offload memory and transmit, um, you know, important information um, from, from generation to generation to think about, you know, the other, another important um, meaning or definition of, of generativity, generations. Um, and so I, I guess like for me, that's one of the most intriguing things and was really an initial hook and is one of the reasons why I've really been so excited to dig deeper into this world of AI literature, even though all of my writing peers, you know, still sort of think this is crazy. Um, but I really do sort of see it as, as monumental as those other shifts in the history of, of human storytelling. I think it's completely changing, you know, how we understand originality and influence and inspiration and is sort of forcing us to confront, um, you know, the fact that, you know, all, all of the, all the literature that we're outputting today really relies on and comes from and is influenced and shaped by all of the literature that's ever been created. And so to me, thinking about AI as this, you know, collective consciousness, this sort of canonical, you know, universal repository of information um, feels to me like it is, you know, it's a it's a it's a familiar sort of conversation to maybe things I've read about or thought about in terms of like creating the Library of Alexandria or the way that someone like T.S. Eliot or Walt Whitman wanted to bring in, you know, many, many, many diverse voices from all different, um, you know, periods of human civilization and, and sort of thinking through what is that deeper seated impulse that writers and artists and creators have always seemed to have, which is to sort of, you know, bring things together, bring disparate ideas, bring different voices, and then synthesize them and kind of try to get to the heart of what it's all pointing towards, which I think is, at least for me, one of the reasons I like using AI. It feels like a way of sifting through vast quantities of information and then getting to sort of pull a needle out of the haystack and then kind of figure out, you know, what is what is that needle like help me see? What does it point me towards? And so I find that philosophically so fascinating and just cracks open all these new possibilities for for, for me as a writer, as well as, as an artist. And then of course, like all the tools I think are just, it's like being a kid in a candy store, getting to constantly be playing, experimenting with these, you know, in many ways, unprecedented um, approaches and platforms and interfaces and, 
just getting to sort of understand, um, you know, how it translates from your mind, how it's how it enables you to sort of um, materialize things that you've never been able to express in a tangible or physical form. I think that that's, I mean, that's incredibly powerful and powerful, of course, beyond the art world, beyond the world of literature. It's powerful as a as a mode for connecting and understanding one another. Um, and so I, I think for all those reasons, it's just, you know, it's it's hard for me to understand how anyone in the in the writing world or the art world would not be like so compelled to try and explore and understand these really complicated tools as much as possible. Do you think it's a matter of inertia or fear why folks aren't uh, diving in as much as you feel like you are? I think there's a lot of fear. I mean, I'm curious what you, what, you know, what everyone um, mm. here thinks about it, but I, I think the most common, um, the most common reaction I get is, you know, it's a mixture of, of fear and then sort of just the not knowing exactly how it works. And so I think um, one of the things that I found the most helpful um, through my own work and then being able to do this, um, you know, through the verse verse as well, has been sort of putting some of these AI tools into the hands of writers who might not otherwise be inclined to try them. And then, you know, once there's a little bit of first firsthand knowledge, it's like, okay, well, now I understand a bit more about what's really happening. And that takes away some of the fear. Um, and then, you know, I, I think with writers, it's the same thing as with artists. There's fear of being um, exploited. There's fear of having your work taken and, you know, to have someone or a company, you know, come in and sort of um, run with your ideas, run with your aesthetic, which is, I think, in many ways, totally justified. But um, sure. I think, you know, it's a good thing maybe to engage with those problems and figure out, you know, how do we how do we harness the best aspects of these technologies? Yeah, I completely agree. I think um, <clears throat> uh, the fear of being um, overtaken, I suppose, by by a tool. But the approach that you take of tying AI to human storytelling, uh, uh, this the evolution of human storytelling, uh, this is like a new chapter in that. Um, that's a really interesting thing. And I'm wondering if if you see that as like kind of the role of the artist to tie technology back to humanity. I feel like that's such a, a critical element of keeping things grounded and centered on um, moving humanity forward and tying this technology back to its core it potentially is a role of the artist. I'm curious if you have any thoughts or responsibility around that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny because I feel like we're so, obviously like we are living in this moment, we, we feel like we all have a very specific definition of what it means to be a modern human. And mm -hmm. um, it just is interesting, I think, to to step back and like, again, think about the longer trajectory of like all the different technological inventions over time that have enabled us to get to this point. And, you know, does it, you know, how different were things before the invention of the steam engine or before electricity or before the telephone or, you know, keep going back and back and back. And I just, it's funny to me to think that, that at this point, like we should just sort of say, well, this is it. This is the culmination of what it means to be human. And then the next step is, you know, is something else completely. It seems to me that, you know, we've always sort of been um, like we've created technologies and then those technologies kind of co-create us in turn. Like mm -hmm. the invention of cooking with fire literally changes, you know, human physiology, changes the human body and enables different kinds of memory and thought processes and cognition. And and that's you know one one example, but I don't know how it's possible to invent a technology and not have that also have you know consequence on on the kind of human beings we are. Really, the thrust of generativity, like at its very root, is something that both nature and technology have in common. And I just I find it so interesting. Mm -hmm. We like to tease them apart as opposed to recognizing how similar these forces are and how much they share. But I would like to know whether there's something um, coming up where you say, okay, that's a development or that's something uh, in the AI world, whatever, I would like to incorporate into my artwork or there's some idea I still am not able to do right now because technology is missing or something like that. Uh, but I would love to do it and hope that I will be able to do it. Do you have... Uh, 
um, visions, uh, what you want to do with, with your work, where you want to go with your work in the next... You are young guys, you are young ladies, so um, I, I hope you still have some, some ideas of the future, what you want to achieve. So I would like to hear. Well, the funny, one of the funny things that I've noticed is, and this is a common, I think, observation, but the more and more advanced that a lot of these AI technologies get, the less and less interesting they become, I think for me as a poet, because the language aspect of it is getting ironed out, a lot of the quirks and the glitches and a lot of the, um, you know, even some of the the more outrageous, you know, things, the mistakes that might have happened, you know, in, in previous versions are changing a bit. So, I mean, going forward, I really like the idea of figuring out how to marry more of the, um, you know, these these advancing tools with more of the genuine kind of surprise and really, you know, the poetic glitches that made me fall in love with these processes in the first place and to figure out how to do that, um, I don't know, really reliably um, is kind of constantly what I want to push towards. Um, I think tactically, something that I as a writer, I always am looking at the, the generative art space. And one of the things I'm a little bit um, maybe envious of in a way is that I still haven't quite cracked the code of how to really generate um, really from scratch, uh, you know, real time poetry that is really, really good. It's <laughs> really that moves me and that I think will hold up over time. And so that's, you know, it's a very hard thing to do. And I think maybe I'm wrong, but I sort of feel like there's a little bit there's a little bit of a difference when you're looking at um, visual outputs. Maybe there's a little bit more leeway when it comes to the language. There's a lot of room, you know, for for things to I don't know, doing a project like that where the outputs really are I don't know as as beautiful and impactful and as poetic as I would want them to be. And I haven't quite figured out how to do that reliably quite yet. Uh, hi, Casey. Um... Glad that you could show up for for a few minutes. Um, Aaron, would you, would you accept that I face uh, Casey in and at first? Uh, or of course, do you, please. Do you, do you want to give a short statement concerning your dreams? Sasha, I will say the uh, the bar that you set for yourself feels incredibly high. Uh, generating beautiful poetry that moves <laughs> um, organically but algorithmically, it sounds like a, a tough challenge. I'm excited to see where you move with that. Um, for me, it's about uh, the framing that Rafael Rosendahl has around his work I really resonate with. Um, having the artwork be fully um, present on uh, any device, you know, on your phone or computer, whatever it is, rather than having to go to a museum and see it. For example, if I wanted to see um, this particular painting um, at the Seattle Art Museum down here, I have to go to the museum or I have to pull up the website and see the picture or the picture I took, a small representation of a facsimile for convenience. Whereas when working with these um, internet-based works, I get to see the work itself um, live and, and fully revealed in front of me anywhere I am. I think that's really interesting. And uh, having some truth to materials is what I'm interested in right now. Really diving into the core of whatever the technology is that I'm playing with at the time. And also, I've been much, uh, I've become kind of obsessed with gardening. So tying, tying the systems that aren't related to uh, my screen or my computer, bringing in that sort of thing in. Some of these more organic, um, you know, media that are outside or in my studio, not necessarily tied to my computer and, and code. So I'm exploring that sort of thing. But the dreams are, are never ending and always changing. I'd say. I want to say hello to Casey. I'm I'm very happy that you join us and um, give us some ideas. We talked quite a while um, about um, the core of generative art uh, as well, well as the meaning of artificial intelligence for generative art. Um, you were not with us, but nevertheless, uh, I think you have a clear picture about that, uh, looking at your own art and looking to the world, producing art. So what? Uh, give us a, a resume uh, of your thoughts about generative art, the code and artificial intelligence. 
Yeah, I, I love these ideas of like getting outside of our own minds, our own bodies, and and uh, working with in a space of ideas and a space of ideas uh, that can create conditions and possibilities and situations. Um, and I think that's something that for me, generative art goes beyond um, computers and software and really becomes a kind of um, experience and goes deep into a lot of um, ways of exploring our world. I think it's this idea of working with with systems um, that expands or moves beyond any specific media. Um, and in specific, I'm very interested in um, sensory experiences, um, things that are sound, um, you know, generative practices in music and things that aren't music too, things that are sound in um, performances, things that happen in space with other people, ways of creating relationships and exchanges between people and communities through generative techniques as well. And then in my own work, I've done that a lot in, in the history and tradition of painting and drawing through writing software. I think this idea of constructing a space of possibilities and then seeing that space of possibilities performed by something that's outside of myself has been like the large motivation of what's been really exciting within that. Do you think that uh, we are um, moving into a fully digital world, that uh, we are moving from, I would not say reality, but because it's also a reality, from mm -hmm. phys physical existence to some kind of a existence of thoughts? Mm. I'm very interested in material um, body sensory environments. I'm, I'm really interested in physicality and materials. And I don't think, I think we're beyond right now uh, a duality of digital space and physical space. I think the two are completely intertwined and interconnected. And I'm very interested in um, being in the world, being with other people in the world and having these direct physical uh, experiences right now. Um, I think there was a time in the 1990s where I was very interested in a space of pure thought. And for me, that that time is kind of long gone. And it, it you know, came out of things like having children, having that experience um, and just being in the digital space enough to know that what I really want is a physical material reality that's augmented um, through communications and connection and networks that, that happen uh, in, a, in a digital way. So that's, that's where the, I am at the moment. The interconnection between the two worlds that are not really two worlds, but one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that echoes what Sasha was saying about um, humanity and technology being teased into two categories, but really they're one and the same. Nature and technology, they're one and the same. Yeah. The two cultures that are only one at the end. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been, the last few minutes, been thinking about this larger picture, which I think I'll, I'll get to that question more directly. Of you, you mentioned the two cultures, and that got me thinking to the CP Snow and science and art. And um, I really believe in science and art being two sides of the same coin, as both the way that we explore um, consciousness, as we explore uh, what it means to be human. Um, and I believe them. I really have been wanting them to intersect more and more. You know, during during out during my entire. Um, my entire, you know, academic career. Um, I think that's where things get really exciting. Uh, let's explore consciousness as artists. Let's explore that and see where things are going with cognitive science and also with philosophy at the same time and having conversations together. And so for me, a lot of these stories really enter um, into, yeah, as Peter said, um, these idea of cybernetics. And I think these cybernetics were explored through poetry, through, um, choreography, through uh, sculpture, importantly, in the 1960s, through and now more recently with software. Um, that's where I believe generative art really had a, a huge surge in energy 
And then I think um, after that, there was another major surge in the 1990s through artificial life research. It became possible to now make simulations in software. Computers got fast enough, we could really start to build these simulations. And I think that was the next surge. And then at the moment, um, I in my opinion, um, artificial intelligence is proceeding faster than many people expect. And as far as I know, that's the very first time in the 60 years of this where, where that has happened. It's always been oftentimes like in 10 years, it will be like this and then it never happens. And so that's been a really unexpected thing that's been, that's been happening recently. That is a very nice final statement. But nevertheless, I want to ask uh, whether Sasha um, has uh, some words uh, you want to add after the discussion we had uh, with uh, Casey. It's, it's really fascinating how much of what we're exploring and what we think of as being so new and so sort of future facing really has such deep roots. My interest in generativity, um, not just AI, but generativity um, more broadly, encompasses things like, you know, even thinking back to the ancient Greeks and the idea of automata and thinking about the idea of, you know, building entities, building machines that could function of their own free will. And what, what would that mean? Um, what would that mean for us as humans? What would it enable us to do? Or thinking about, um, you know, things like the I Ching and um, the idea of divination and using chance as a way to access ideas that we know intuitively are really important, but that through our human programming, we can't quite get in touch with. So I think there's something about this that feels to me both like very forward facing, but also deeply ancient and like very much rooted in human desire. And I, I just, I think that maybe that's one reason why it just it feels so resonant and so important. And um, it's really, it's really wonderful to hear and be part of more and more conversations that are really um, about situating things like AI in, in this larger context, because I, I agree very much with what Casey was saying, that this is, it's not just about technologies, it's not about gadgets or gizmos or robots or any of those things. This is about what it means to be human. Um, and it's about, you know, uh, all, all these things that that poets and artists and philosophers have really been grappling with for a long time. It's just the technologies are sort of changing. Uh, the manifestations of the technologies are changing. Um, but I think a lot of the impulses, um, you know, have deep roots. So it's a fascinating conversation to, to listen in on and to, to be part of as well. I would like to, to thank you uh, for, for your very interesting and deep thinking, I don't know, is this an English word, deep thinking, words, <laughs> ideas? <laughs> and I really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot and bye-bye. Uh, Thanks, Suzanne. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Suzanne.